Can you hear me now? Okay, there we go. Um, well, unlike most of you probably in this room who uh, I suspect are, are studying science or becoming scientists or maybe becoming fishery scientists, um, I am not a scientist by training. I am a history buff, history major by training, but I have been involved in protecting rivers and salmon and the other attributes um, of rivers and salmon and wilderness uh, since, my, since college and for the last 20 years since graduating, graduating. And I got involved in the salmon issues mostly from the perspective of forest habitat issues uh, growing up in western Oregon in a fishing and timber town, uh, Coos Bay, Oregon, for those of you who know the coast and then a little timber community upstream from there called Allegheny, which probably none of you here have heard of. 
And I got involved just witnessing what was happening to our, the salmon populations in the Millicoma River that was about 20 yards from my front door and seeing what was happening to the forests and also seeing what was happening not just to the landscape and the ecosystem around Coos Bay, but also what was happening to our economy there and our industry of seeing this overuse and overlogging of the landscapes around there and then the resulting 25% unemployment when all the timber companies cut everything and left town and left that, that part of the country. And so I have been really involved in that intersection between protecting wilderness, protecting landscapes and natural resources, as well as the economic end of that, of how do we both protect economies and local economies and resources, and how, in fact, by protecting those natural resources, we actually can provide more sustainability and more security for some of those those communities down the road. And I moved to Eastern Washington in the mid 90s. And over in my work in Western Oregon, I'd really focused on logging because the development and the timber practices were a huge effect on what was happening to the salmon runs over there. When I moved over here, over into the inland Northwest, uh, it became apparent that there was this other huge factor out there that was keeping salmon from returning in the numbers they should be into some of our river systems. And in Spokane, where I live, it's very abundantly obvious what the problem is because Grand Coulee cuts all the historic salmon that used to come to Spokane completely off, and they're all gone. But then beginning to work on Idaho salmon issues, where you have the most bet, like pristine salmon habitat left in the lower 48, the biggest contigu contiguous section and the Frank Church return, you know, River of No Return wilderness and the other large wildernesses, we still didn't have salmon coming back. It's like, wow, there's another factor here at play. And it is the hydro system that we've built up on the Columbia and Snake Rivers that is the primary factor for the decline of those fish. I mean, 80% of the problem is that hydro system. And uh, I found myself getting involved in the complicated world of um, Bonneville Power Administration and energy and transportation and dealing with these large physical obstructions in rivers and frankly it made working on the timber issues seem like a cakewalk <laughs> in some ways. But the issues are, very this, are really the same uh, in, in some significant ways. And so I thought what I'd talk about tonight is talk a bit about that resource we have here in the Snake River Basin and the value of those fish, why they're so important, um, why they're worth saving, why we do have a good shot at saving them, and, uh, and then talk a bit about how the Snake River dams relate to that and why our coalition is focusing so much on those and sort of talk a little bit about what's happening downstream from that fantastic habitat in Idaho um, and the efforts and how those issues are affecting and keeping those salmon from um, being plentiful up in Idaho. And you know, there was always already a quick introduction, but our coalition has been around since 1991. And we were formed in the early 90s when all the endangered salmon runs were getting either you know, petitioned petition for listing under the Endangered Species Act or were already listed. And it started with the sockeye salmon, Idaho sockeye salmon in 1991. And then we saw Snake River Spring Summer Chinook, and we saw Fall Chinook, and we saw Steelhead all end up on the list. And prior to that, a lot of the entities and interests involved in efforts to protect salmon restoration, whether it was the conservation groups, the sport fishing groups and businesses who were you know, focused on recreational fishing opportunities, you had the commercial fishing fishermen who were focused on their opportunities, and then of course you had the Native American tribes out there who have a treaty, uh, treaty rights and legal rights to a certain, certain cut and a, you know, a, uh, the, the legal right to hunt and fish in their accustomed places. And what you had happening, the tribes are their own governments, so they're sort of their own separate 
um, separate entity. But among the other user groups there, and people concerned about the rivers, there was a lot of infighting going on and people fighting over the last of the fish in some ways of what was going to happen to them. And our coalition was formed to try to get the sport fishing folks and commercial fishermen and conservation groups to quit fighting each other on all these other um, areas, whether it was not quit fighting, they could still keep fighting over hatchery management, over allocation, over all of that, but that we all came together to really focus on 80% of the problem, which was how the hydro system was being managed. And so for a number of years, our coalition focused on trying to make the hydro system more fish friendly, um, creating and pushing for more flows of water down the river, uh, creating more spill at the dams to try to make the river operate more like a, like a river and less like a series of lakes. But then in, by the mid-90s, and 1997 was sort of the key target date, we were seeing a lot of the science, both economic studies and science coming out, looking at what was the best thing that we could do to restore Snake River salmon. And what we were hearing and what some of the Corps of Engineers own people were telling them is that the best thing, the single biggest thing we need to do for these fish to save them is to remove the four lower Snake River dams. And it's probably also economically uh, the best solution that we have too. And I'll get into that, though some of those issues a little later into the talk. But it was at that point that our coalition which is a very diverse group of people, let me tell you, uh, decided to formally endorse removal of those four lower Snake River dams and focus specifically, although we, our, our members and our coalition cares about all the salmon in the Columbia and Snake River Basin, um, we made a decision to focus on the Snake River Basin and to focus on removing those four dams as the single best uh, tactic and best direction that we could as a coalition do to restore salmon, not just to Idaho, but to the downstream communities uh, from Riggins, Idaho, down through the Columbia River, out to the coastal fishing communities such as I grew up in, and up in Alaska, because these salmon migrate all the way up into Alaska, and they affect those fisheries up there too. And if you're interested afterwards, I actually have a map over on the table that shows the um, the migrations of the salmon, so you can take a look at that. And so that's what we've been working on. And, and as I go through and talk about how incredible these salmon are and the role that they play in the wilderness systems here, um, I'm hoping you too will agree why these fish uh, are so worth protecting and so worth focusing on when we're looking at um, Columbia River Basin populations. Not that we shouldn't work on all the other salmon populations as well, but why we focus on them. And I'll just apologize, I'm not used to PCs, it's been a while. Um, and so, historically, I'll just talk a little bit about the salmon. So, his, the Columbia Basin salmon, historically, 13 or 16 to 30 million salmon entered the mouth of the Columbia River every single year prior to human settlement. Um, depending, depending on the year and the various fluctuations. And it's a huge, huge number. Today, we have less than 2% of the wild stocks returning to the Columbia Basin. Um, there's a lot of stocks that have still have gone extinct already. Some are hanging on, um, more so than others. And there's a map showing you um, where the dams are, and the, the blue that you see there is the Snake River Basin um, highlighted. Um, historically, before the dams were in the system, as I mentioned before, they went clear up into Canada, into the Canadian lakes, the big June hogs that were up to 120 pounds or more. Um, Spokane actually was one of the biggest fishing sites, Native American fishing sites in the entire system. It was as big as Celilo Falls, which we hear more about. Uh, when Lewis and Clark came through, the reason they didn't find any, um, any men on the Weeite Prairie was because they were all up fishing in Spokane at the time. Um, they also went as far as Nevada, 
which also a lot of people don't know, up through the Owyhee River drainage, up the Jarbage River and Bruno Rivers. They fed the, the early miners that were working in northern Nevada. Um, they went, obviously, also clear up past Boise, Idaho. There was a huge salmon cannery in, in Boise, Idaho, prior to the development and all the dams that went in. And so we had already lost a lot of the habitat. Um, but in the 19, you know, in 1960, we still had some healthy, sustainable runs of salmon returning to Idaho. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit about kind of the history of those dams going in, the four lower Snake River dams, and the declines that happened. But here you kind of get a sense of, of the um, area. And one other thing that's important of why we focus on the Snake River Basin so much is that, it, it, you know, in landmass, it's not half of the entire land base of the Columbia River, but it has, it had historically more than half of the most productive salmon habitat in the entire Columbia Basin system. Very productive rivers, great habitat, um, both in the tributaries and the main rivers, like the Salmon, the Grand Ronde, and, or and it's just, of course, not just in Idaho. We're talking Northeast Oregon, Grand Ronde ri River, Wanaha to Cannon, those rivers, in, or in Southeast Washington, and then, um, yeah, Grand Ronde and Naha, Wanaha there in Northeast Oregon and Eagle Cap Wilderness area. Um, and so, still today, there's over 5,000 miles of productive, relatively pristine salmon habitat um, in Idaho alone. And that's not counting what's in Northeast Oregon and Southeast Washington. And um, this is a little long of a quote, but is worth reading. So, these dams were the four lower Snake River dams. You know, the Columbia dams had already been built. We, the, you had seen declines in the salmon as the various large dams went into the system. But uh, you still had, as I said, healthy, harvestable numbers of salmon returning to Idaho that people could fish up into the tributaries, um, sustained people both you know, food-wise, met our obligations with the um, treaty tribes down in the area. We had enough coming back that they were self-sustaining. Um, early on in the first part of the 20th century, some boosters in Lewiston, Idaho, uh, decided to start uh, arguing for a seaport in Idaho at Lewiston by damming the lower Snake River all the way to Lewiston, Idaho. And even early on, even in the 1940s when this first got proposed, the sport fishermen and the fish and game agencies knew exactly what was going to happen to the salmon if these dams were built. And this quote here is from the Washington Department of Fish and Game, who loudly opposed the building of the first dam, Ice Harbor Dam, um, in the Lower Snake River uh, uh, um, complex, which is Ice Harbor, Little Goose, Lower Monumental, and then Lower Granite. And they were unsuccessful in stopping Ice Harbor. Then there wasn't that much of a fight. People sort of gave up a bit. Uh, when the other next two dams were built. But then come 1970, in the late 60s, as more dams were being proposed all up the system, all these different places, the sport fishermen and conservationists started getting organized because they'd seen what the declines that were already happening in the fish and decided to try to fight lower granite. And a few of those guys are still alive and in Spokane. And um, listening to their stories and the effort that they put in to try to stop those dams is, is pretty inspiring and also a little bit heartbreaking because they weren't successful. However, they were able to stop some of the other dams that were um, planned up the system. And so Lower Granite Dam went in despite people's warnings that it was going to be the death knell for the salmon, that the dams really um, did not pencil out economically, and that bringing a seaport to Idaho, to Lewiston, was not going to be the economic salvation of that town, which it clearly hasn't. Oh, there's the, uh, that's right. And then this kind of goes over the, when the dams went in. Um, Ice Harbor actually, I need to change that, actually went in in 1960. Um, 
And the main reason for those dams going in, as I mentioned before, was to create a seaport to ship soft white wheat down from Lewiston down to the ports um, in Portland and out to the Pacific Rim. Um, they are not flood control dams. It's very minimal irrigation. They are not water storage dams. They are um, simply run of river dams to allow barges to go back. There is irrigation off one dam, Ice Harbor, um, but all you'd have to do is lower the pipes. You could continue irrigating. You just have to do the pump modifications if the dams were to come out. And then energy, which I'll go into later, is also about 4% of all the energy that BPA uh, generates in the whole region, which is Bonneville Power Administration, which is the federal agency that markets all the energy that is generated off the dams. Um, they are not real, they, and they really only produce that in the spring. They are not good at energy, they don't really produce much energy at all in the winter or the times that our region really needs energy. Their main purpose was for transportation. Um, to come in and to compete with the rail system that was already, already in the region. And so this kind of shows you the declines that we've seen in numbers, in wild numbers, um, since the Lower Snake River dams were built. And I will, one caveat here is that during the time that these Lower Snake River dams were built, we also had a couple other large dams go in that have also factored into this, one being Dwarshack, Dwarshack Dam up on the um, fork of the Clearwater, which uh, decimated, destroyed the largest bee run steelhead <laughs> run in the world. Um, so that also went in. But the majority of the cause of our salmon declines happening uh, were the construction of those dams. Um, but unfortunately, and I'm not going to get that much into it, but if you have questions in the question answer period, I can talk more about it. Um, the, a lot of the declines in the wild stocks have been masked by um, the huge proliferation of hatchery salmon and steelhead that are being pumped into the river systems um, at higher and higher numbers. And our coalition, because of our diversity, does not take a position on hatcheries. <laughs> um, it's very divisive between our member groups. Um, uh, but I'm happy to answer questions on it and give my personal perspective. Uh, but I think the thing that all of our member groups do, do agree on is that uh, hatchery fish are great for catching fish and for shoring up commercial fishing towns and sport fishing businesses and recreational opportunities that have been lost due to the declines. Um, they have been you know, a, um, um, a resource in that way, but they are not a replacement for the wild genetics or the wild stocks. It is extremely important. Um, both if we want to keep that connectivity and the health of our ecosystems to have those wild salmon coming back and spawning in those rivers, that the health of the, that, that, uh, that even if we want to continue hatchery programs, we still need to maintain those wild genetics um, to keep a hatchery program going that is sustainable as well. And the unfortunate thing in the media and the news that's happened, um, I think, is that we have seen a bump up in runs in the last few years, and I can talk a bit about why that's happened. Um, but a lot of the declines are masked by just the huge numbers of hatchery fish are being pumped into the system. And so people wonder why is it that, you know, they're talking about taking dams out or these fish are on the endangered species list when I can go out and catch them and people are catching them on the rivers. And um, the, the fisheries are targeting the hatchery salmon, not the wild. And um, it's really masking the serious declines that we're seeing in the wild stocks. And there's a, just another shot to show you of the spring summer Chinook. Um, and today from a biological perspective, I don't know if this is the official line of my organization, but it's my personal, I think it's what a lot of fisheries biologists that study the system are, is that we've already lost a lot of the genetics in the fall Chinook. Um, and in the Idaho sockeye, which I'll talk about a little bit more, um, which right now are being sustained, the ones that go back to Redfish Lake up 900 miles, um, they're being sustained by a hatchery program because there just is so few numbers. We had only one come back, you know, in 1991, Lonesome Larry, um, that they've had to rely on the hatcheries so much so that it's a really different set of genetics now than it was when there were still wild populations coming back. 
However, when it comes to spring, summer Chinook, which ants as well as steelhead, both of which it spawned up in those tributaries, we still have some incredible genetics left, um, particularly up in the middle fork of the salmon in that Idaho wilderness, which I'm going to talk about, because hatcheries weren't built up there. And those genetics are really strong and really important to, um, to protect. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit about, in particular, the salmon in Idaho. And there are also incredible genetics there in the wild lands of northeast Oregon and some pretty little special areas in, south, in southeast Washington, too. But I am going to focus a lot on uh, the Salmon River drainage and Idaho in particular. Um, and why we just talk a bit about why we want to protect these fish so much. Um, the genetics, these, the salmon that go clear up to um, the middle fork of the salmon drainage and up into the sawtooth and those Idaho mountains are just incredible fish. They swim farther than any other run of salmon in the world. The only one that comes close is uh, the Yukon. They swim upwards of 900 miles. Well, they go downstream when the smolts come out, of course. In their, in their natal streams and go downstream, they go 900 miles, but then they go all the way up, um, 900 miles, and they also climb the highest elevation of any other salmon in the world. They spawn up in streams that are up at 6,500 feet up in Idaho. And, uh, and so that makes those genetics of those salmon really pretty special. And that right there is a photo of Dagger Falls, which is a pretty incredible place to go watch salmon um, on the middle fork of the salmon. <coughs> and there's just incredible habitat up there. We're talking over 3 million um, acres of wilderness. We're also just talking a lot of not densely populated, incredibly productive habitat. Um, it, these, these streams should be full of salmon, and they're not. And, uh, um, and even when you look at, you know, it's not like there are streams up there, of course, that do have impacts, whether it's from grazing or development or past mining, other, other impacts of that sort. Um, but I've even seen studies looking at the numbers of salmon in pristine, um, pristine rivers in the wilderness compared to some of the more degraded streams. And there's really no difference in the number of salmon populations. There's a very tiny difference. And it's really because there's a whole other factor downstream. It's not about the habitat up there. It's about the fact that, we, that the salmon just can't get up into this habitat. Um. And uh, the other thing that's important, too, I want to touch on, too, is that we, you know, we get a lot of questions. And I'm sure you guys are studying this and thinking about this as well. But <coughs> there's obvious huge concerns for what's going to happen to our cold water fisheries um, in a climate change scenario and in a warming world. There are studies out there that say you know, we're going to lose 40 to 60% of our cold water fisheries. Um, across the West due to rising temperatures in the streams. Um, as you guys know, I mean, when you look at trout and salmon, steelhead, bull trout too, of course, they're very, very temperature, um, uh, temperature dependent and don't deal well with the high temperatures, which is one of the problems that we have down in the reservoirs when they have to swim through that hot, nasty, fetid water behind the lower Snake River dams <coughs> is that it just kills them off. Um, both coming and going. Um, but, and so that's a big concern that fishery scientists are looking at. Um, but you know, one thing that a lot of the research shows is that the more connectivity that you have in wilderness systems or in ecosystem systems, the more resilient that system's going to be um, to climate change. And another thing that we know, too, is that the, I mean, the larger, more intact systems that we have, the more shot that um, the salmon and steelhead and other species have of surviving. And so there's some fisheries biologists, too, because I've had some people make an argument to me, well, they're just a lost cause. It's too much, and 
in a warming world, shouldn't we be putting our energies or our time and money into other systems? Um, but what some of the fisheries biologists are saying, and one being Don Chapman, who was a longtime fisheries biologist at the University of Idaho, was opposed to dam removal for a long time, and then did this very public about face um, about 10 years ago, and finally came out and said, you know what? We have got to take those four dams out if we're going to save Idaho salmon. And one of his arguments was both the temperature issues down on the lower snake in particular, but the other, the other issue and argument that he made was that um, these fish with their genetics and the fact that they spawn at such high elevations may have a better shot at surviving in climate change than some of the populations that we're seeing in other river systems that are naturally hotter down in desert systems. Um, already dealing with development and other impacts because they're not, it's not such connected high quality habitat. That those are the ones that we're most likely to, to lose. If you want to hang on to wild genetics and maybe in the future help repopulate some of those other streams if we do get climate change turned around, God help us, but uh, that these are the genetics that we really need to be saving. And so that's one of the big arguments that we've been pushing about the value of Snake River salmon that, um, you know, they may be in low numbers, but they are really worth fighting for. And the fact that we don't have to restore a bunch of habitat, we have this connected habitat up there, if we can just get the salmon there. And, uh, and I think one other point I, I do want to make, which um, is not new news anymore, there's a lot of cool studies happening on it, but just reminding people that salmon are not a species that we can just live without, without consequences. Not just to the communities that depend on them, but also um, these ecosystems. I mean, they are that wilderness connector, that connectivity from the sea to the mountains. And in Idaho and a lot of our systems, as you guys know, here in the inland northwest, is that we have, you know, kind of poor soils and low productivity systems in a lot of places, like in the Idaho Batholith and those other places, and all those nutrients are going downstream. And the salmon are the one thing, right, that brings those nutrients back up into the stream. And you know, we all know that story now, but I, I also think it's, it's worth remembering that you know, 135 species alone depend on either fully as a main food source, salmon, or rely on the trace mineral, minerals and nutrients that they bring into the systems. Deer eat carcasses. It's not just about the bear, then all the bugs, all the little trout you know, fry, all the salmon fry, all of that live on those nutrients. And you know, as you guys know, they're now doing these huge projects where they're taking fish carcasses and flying them up and dumping them into these systems that used to produce those naturally and that we don't have anymore. And, uh, and I think there's some really great research happening on those connections. Um, some of it out of WSU, so a lot of it I think out of Montana State as well. And one of the systems they've been looking at is in you know, Alaska, right, where they still have these natural salmon ecosystem connections. And looking at tree growth rings, where 20% of the growth of a tree is directly related to nitrogen taken from salmon by the bears eating the salmon, going up in the woods and doing what bears do best and then all those trees sucking that up. And you know, when you look at a system like that, and we don't think about grizzly, that grizzly bear salmon or bear salmon connection. Well, you guys do here in Montana, <laughs> but we don't think about it a lot in eastern Washington or in eastern Oregon or those places where they were extirpated a long time ago. Um, but when you go back, one of the interesting things they've done is gone back to analyze the hair on the pelts, the grizzly bear pelts that um, were shot and killed and brought back um, on Lewis and Clark's expedition. And even down in burns, like in Malheur County, Oregon, in the high desert of southeast Oregon, they, they did a sample and they can test it by looking at the isotopes in the hair. You guys know more about this than I do, so I'm going to get something wrong here. But, and they can determine whether it came from a, mari a marine source or a non-marine source. And when they studied this grizzly bear pelt, 80 percent of that bear's nutrients had come from salmon. And, uh, and I love the eastern, the high desert, and I love eastern Oregon, and it's a really area, I mean, it's, 
there's not a lot of nutrient and lushness in that system. And now when I go back and go to the Malheur River, some of those salmon, Snake River tributaries that used to have these prolific salmon runs, and I think about that, like what did that system look like when that huge influx of marine nutrients is coming into those systems and what have we lost? And I think that's something to think about in wilderness management in Idaho in Northeast Oregon and these other places is what are we going to lose over the long term? What do we even you know, not realize what we're losing? Whether it's the size of the trees that grow, you know, the kinds of plants, obviously, you know, the connections to the bugs and everything's been documented. And so I think there's an argument to, made, to be made in a climate change scenario that salmon are a real important part of that connectivity in that system of maintaining it because <coughs> they're going to keep it healthier by bringing those nutrients back in. And there's just some shots. I've gotten all excited about talking. I've not gone through my... And I will say, too, that I accidentally deleted my PowerPoint presentation this morning and had to rebuild it really quickly. So a little apologize, apologies there. And this is just a shot of... I had some other photos in here, but this is one of the redfish sockeye that I talked about now. It's just being kept going by this, um, you know, Rube Goldberg. I mean, it's a great system. I mean, God bless it that it's there, um, that we still have some sockeye coming back to Idaho. But um, they're all now just taken in. They're, they're, they just in the last couple of years started letting any of them spawn again in Redfish Lake. Um, they've been taking all, because so few salmon have been coming back, that they just scoop them up and, you know, slit them for the eggs and do the, um, the fertilization and everything artificially. And uh, a really fantastic documentary that I recommend that's one of the best synopsises of what we've done to the Columbia system um, that's in an hour is called, is a PBS nature documentary that ran, I think, two years ago, a year and a half ago, called Running the Gauntlet. And it sort of begins and ends its whole um, the whole documentary on that sawtooth hatchery and what those salmon are going through now and, uh, and what we've done, all the money and all the technology that we're using right now to try to make up for all these, um, all the damage we've done to a system that used to work on its own. And um, I'm just going to touch briefly on uh, sort of what we're doing downstream. And then you know, if people have questions, I'd love to chat uh, and question and answer period. Um, but now that I've kind of talked about the value of these SAM, I want to talk a little bit about um, the work that we're doing in the communities of trying to, to figure out, is there a solution that can work for the people that have depended on these dams? Is there a solution for us to find other ways of getting the benefits from those dams? And um, and you know, getting rid of those dams so that we can restore these salmon back into these wild rivers we have. Um, and it's also a bit about, too, the fact that there's a lot of other reasons to take out these four dams other than the salmon. And obviously, I'm focusing more on the salmon here, but um, I can talk a bit about that later if there's time. And so what I work on in Spokane, I spend a lot of time down in Lewiston, Idaho, and also talking with some of the farmers and the growers and others who, some who quietly support what we're trying to do and some who are nervous about what we're proposing. Um, but we have kind of a project called Working Snake River, which is sort of getting to those economic connections and how can we figure out a plan to restore these fish that works for all the stakeholders. And, um, and one of the things, too, is just talking a little bit about the lower Snake River corridor itself. Um, you know, the primary spectacular habitat and beautiful landscape shots are, you know, all up in the Idaho wilderness um, for people who love mountains and all that. Um, but there's some pretty amazing shrub step desert habitat that was down in the lower Snake River corridor that we've lost. And, you know, when you know, me and my Spokane friends see all these cool photos of the river before the dams and all that. We're all like ooing and aahing, and all my coworkers and fishermen who live in Western Oregon and are used to big lush forests are all like, "What are you looking at? I don't, I don't see the beauty here." But, um, but uh, 
The Lower Snake River Corridor was both a really productive and popular place to fish. It's, ha it's salmon habitat itself, the fall Chinook, the spring summer Chinook go up and spawn in the tributaries, but the fall Chinook were the species that spawned in the main stem um, of the Lower Snake River and up into the mouths of some of the tributaries. And uh, when the Lower Snake River dams came in, you know, it's about 140 river miles. Um, we lost, you know, over 14,000 acres of really prime upland bird habitat, other kinds of wildlife habitat, um, other fish habitat, um, some just great hiking. I talked to some of the guys, and was they mostly guys, some women who hunted that and fished it before the dams, and it was a really special place to them. You know, we lost a lot of cool river recreation as well. There was 50 uh, rapids that we lost and just lots of river bars and islands that used to provide really productive habitat for all kinds of birds and other wildlife. And I'm just going to go through a couple of these shots. That's an early, early 1900 shot, um, uh, not far from Wawai, which is, was a little old um, agricultural town that was drowned by Lower Granite Dam. But it was just some, some pretty spectacular country. Um, a lot of people, now you go down the lower <laughs> river, now that it's inundated, you don't run into very many people there using it or fishing along it. But historically, there were huge fishing camps down on the lower Snake River where people would come down and get to pick their salmon out or steelhead out of a box. Um, this was the grasser fishing camp back in the early 1900s. <coughs> Um, and just some really incredible steelhead runs. This is where Alpoa Creek comes in, which is just downstream from Clarkston. Um, and that particular little spot was just supposed to be an amazing steelhead hole to fish. People fished it. Um, this is the site of Lower Granite Dam before the dams went in. You see the little kind of cool looking canyon up there. That's where Lower Granite is today. It just gives you a, an idea of sort of the the islands and everything that were in it. This is a picture of Penawawa, which was one of the really productive agricultural um, towns, little communities that got drowned out by the dams. There were lots of farmlands, lots of um, fruit orchards, and uh, watermelon, melons, everything that was grown down, um, down in the bottomlands. And that's that same site today. Um, I know one of the wheat farmers I work with manages a little peach orchard. There's a little vestige of two acres of peaches left um, where Penawawa was. So we lost a lot of um, human connectivity to that river and a lot of other resources and values that we just um, aren't talked about. And just briefly about what the dams provide us. I already kind of touched on that. As I mentioned before, um, it's you know, their main purpose is to ship soft white wheat down to Portland. And I don't have time, if people have questions, I'm happy to talk about it in Q&A. Um, but that value of the system is really in steep, steep decline. What we've been advocating and some other, not just us, but some other folks are advocating is going back to the rail system and doing the investments in rail that used to ship all that wheat down to market. Um, rather than the barge system. Um, as it, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, there are farmers now that are more interested in wanting to ship goods by rail rather than the barge system. In many cases, because they want to also get goods to the Seattle ports rather than port, the Portland port. Snake River dams will get your stuff to the port of Portland. They do not provide, they do not get your goods to port, um, the Seattle ports. So, and it's a system that really only, you know, there's some timber, there's some other uh, items that are shipped on it. It's primarily for wheat. If you are a manufacturer or you have other transportation needs, most likely those lower, those, um, that barge system isn't what you need to get your goods to market. You need a rail system. That's one of the conversations we're having with the local communities. Um, and there's shifts happening that have nothing to do with us. I mean, Port of Lewiston, which has always touted itself as the best thing that ever happened to Lewiston, Idaho, right now is shipping the lowest amount of goods 
on the Lower Snake River that they ever have in their entire existence because shippers are going to other means of shipping. Um, the paper company there used to ship all on the river. They now do almost solely truck and rail, um, not the barge system. So one of the things we're trying to do is to raise awareness on that fact and ask the question, is this the best use of millions and millions and millions of dollars of taxpayer dollars maintaining and dealing with this waterway when we could be using that money into rail systems that would provide transportation to more businesses and more communities and we could have our salmon back. Energy replacement options. Um, when you look at what our region is going to need long term in, in, on the energy front and what these dams are providing, it is a little drop in the bucket. And those numbers are highly generous. Um, really, a lot of people say it's about 2% of what BPA is producing. And it's about 1,000 megawatts, but that's being generous. When the Northwest Power Planning Council looked at, and they do not, they are not fans of what we want to do. When they did their own analysis, they showed that we only need to have 720 megawatts of power, additional power, to replace all four of those dams. You look at the wind farm that's just outside of Walla Walla, and that alone produces, has brought 600 megawatts online. That's not quite apples and oranges. There's different, <laughs> it's more complicated but, than that, but it gives you an idea of the opportunities that we have out there. These dams are outdated energy that are not worth their cost. And I have a great um, flyer over there that's on a study that looked at where we get our energy from clean sources without those dams in place that you can pick up. Oh, and there's, yeah, oh yeah, there's a, um, a slide of it looking at what our increased electric demand is by 2050 and where our best sources are, what we're going to need to do to make that, um, to meet our energy needs. And the Lower Snake River dams are just not part of the pie, even if they still are online. Um, one other quick thing, too, is that's an interesting issue. Ask me a question about it. Um, is down in Lewiston of the major, not only do these dams not provide flood control, Lower Granite is creating a really big flood risk for Lewiston. Because, as I mentioned, they wanted to dam the river all the way up the system. Um, they weren't allowed to do that. And now Lower Granite is the last dam with all the Salmon River drainage and all those free-flowing rivers all flowing down to it, and it's dumping all its natural sediment right there at Lewiston. So they have this series of levees in the town and the freeboard, like the space to kind of protect from flood is supposed to be five feet and it's down to a foot and a half in places. And um, uh, the town does not want the levees raised, but it's their only real option for dealing with the problem. And what they find themselves in is a small mini New, like New Orleans problem where the level of the river now is higher than some of the historic, like the, the, the historic downtown area of Lewiston. And they're protected only by this levee. And that's an issue that we're talking to locals about, is looking at a long-term view of their waterfront and what do they want to see there long-term. And this just shows you what Lewiston lost. And um, there used to be these incredible beaches in Lewiston, um, people who, our major dam proponents there like to say, well, nobody used the river before. It was too dangerous. And, um, but when you go back and look at the historic photos, you see these incredible beaches. Um, and this is what it is today. <laughs> you, know, you used to have beaches. Now you've got riprap and, and just um, a reservoir. That's the old swimming beach um, that used to be there. They used to have Snake River days in the summer. And now, you know, they have a nice bike path, but it's all rip-wrapped. And if you spend any time there, it's really hard to get down to, to the river and nearly impossible for my 15-year-old dog to get down to the river on that. And I will just show you, too, if you look on the other side, there's the wheat grain elevators that are still there today. And there is a train sitting right there that used to haul, haul it. And then that's just an old shot. Some of the fishermen and others, we've asked for them to send their family photos to us and family videos of um, how they used to use the river. 
And so just back again, just to this. So, um, uh, so these are clearly worth saving, and you know you may ask the question, well, what are the chances of taking out these four dams? They're too big. You're never going to do it. You've been working on it for 15 years. Why don't you know me personally? Why don't you give up? There's other people that have been at it for far longer. Um, but I think um, I think it is worth. It. I think the value of these salmon is worth keeping pushing the dialogue going. And one of the really encouraging, exciting things that's happening too are all the other smaller dam removals happening around the country and in the Northwest that are just really powerful and are really capturing the imaginations of the locals and the people in the communities who have come together and agreed to take out these dams. It's going to be really exciting to see Elwha Dam restoration happen as those dams come out. And there's a great blog and some great photos of that restoration in progress on the Seattle Times website that are really fun to look at. Um, you have Condit Dam, the White Salmon River down um, near, near uh, um, well, near White Salmon, Washington. And, uh, and what they're seeing is the restoration in all these rivers where they're taking these dams out, the restoration is happening far quicker than they expected. The salmon are coming back far quicker than expected. And I think it's really showing people what we can do. And so I don't ever get asked the question when I go to the sportsman shows or anything or out in the public, like, how can you, you know, you can't prove it's going to work. Like, most people realize it's going to work. The question now is, well, how are you going to pay for it and how, um, how are you going to, you know, replace the benefits those dams are? And that's a much better place to be having a conversation. And one of the things that we're working on just politically is that, it's trying to, we've been in court and winning in court for 20 years, and, uh, but it's not helping the salmon. We keep winning in court, and then the feds are back trying to come up with a new plan that doesn't involve looking at dam removal, and it gets ruled <coughs> illegal because there's no way it can pass legal muster or biological muster, and, uh, and then we're back in court. So what we've been pushing is let's bring the stakeholders together and have a real conversation guided by science by law and by real economics. And we're willing to look at other options too if people are also willing to do an honest assessment of dam removal. And there are people willing to come to the table. There are wheat growers and others in the communities are, are very quietly saying we're willing to have that conversation. And what's happening right now as the legal stuff continues to wend its way <laughs> through court is that we've had Governor Kitzhaber of Oregon and and um, we're hoping that Jay Inslee of Washington um, gets on board too. The Idaho governor has also, um, in previous um, years, supported a similar effort, is bringing people together and having that conversation. So we've got some political momentum now finally happening. And we have the NOAA Fisheries Agency, which is the federal agency in charge of anadromous fish, now also have signed off on such a process. And so they're interviewing people right now and kind of figuring out what that process is going to look like. Um, and so we hope that it really does produce something and that it's not just a bunch of, you know, uh, process. And that we can, ha we can have what hap what's happened on Condit and Elwha and these other dams happen on the snake. And so that's sort of where things are today. So I remain hopeful. Um, I think it will be another 20 years before we see those dams out. I think that we can get a decision, a long-term plan for taking those dams out sooner than that. And if we want them to come out in 20 years, we have to start doing the analysis now and coming up with that plan. And, you know, Elwha took 20 years. This one's going to take a long time. And, and this would be the single biggest river restoration on Earth if we succeed. And so I think it's worth working on. So, thanks. <laughs> Questions? What is the difference between the say, what, what, besides the bars, the say the core of the what stops, what, what's the holdup? Why is it so hard? <laughs> Why don't people, is, was the question, if anyone didn't 
here and who, who are our opposition. Um, they have, it's shifted over the years a bit. Um, and it's, there's, a, there's a few different figures. There are like the Washington Weed Alliance and the entities that are the lobbying entities and the, the big boys among the wheat growers and the shippers um, are really unwilling to have a conversation. The local people and the people on the ground are quietly willing to have a conversation and interested in it. Um, but there's a fear factor to come out uh, and say anything. Likewise, the short rail lines would love to, of course, see this happen. And again, they find it hard to come out publicly. You know, one of them said, I light a candle every night, <laughs> but I can't come out publicly. Um, I think our biggest entity, our biggest opposition has been Bonneville Power Administration, which is a federal agency that operates like a quasi-corporation, frankly. And um, BPA does lots of good things, <laughs> a lot of good programs. But I have to say that there is an arrogance and a lack of looking at things through new eyes at BPA. Um, we hope that maybe the new administrator has a different perspective. We hope that the, new Obama, the second Obama administration is less scared and is willing to push a little harder. And we also hope that you know, we're seeing s some movement in the Northwest delegation, uh, the congressional delegation, to, to be willing to have a conversation. <coughs> so BPA has operated that river as if they control and own every drop of water. And we ought to say thank you and bow down to them for every little drop of water that they happen to let go through for salmon. And, uh, and that's, not the way that, that's not the way they should be operating that river. Um, you know, under the Northwest Power Planning Act, salmon are supposed to have equal consideration <laughs> to the power, um, power generation, and that just hasn't happened. And then we also have our senators, who also are such staunch defenders of Bonneville Power Administration, is the sacred cow. Um, because other senators and politicians elsewhere in the country really resent the cheap power deal that the Northwest gets. We pay the cheapest power in the country. And so there's some of them that have said, how is it that you know, you're paying a quarter of what the rest of us are, and you're, you don't have enough money? You can't make enough adjustments to save the salmon? Are you kidding me? Um, and so we found the Northwest delegation just, you can't, it's hard to, they will not criticize Bonneville Power Administration. And that's been a, that's been a problem. And I would say that Senator Murray has been this, one of the worst obstacles to having a conversation happen. Senator Mike Crapo from Idaho has been willing to have a conversation at times. He's not willing to step out, but you know, we've had more thoughtful response from the Idaho delegation, because it's their salmon too, but from some senators you think might be more opposed um, than Senator Murray. Although she has shifted, I will say we're seeing a shift in the politics where they're saying, okay, we're, you know, and they've seen and seen the positive press happening on Elwha and on these other dams and said, okay, maybe we don't have to be so afraid. Um, the public utility districts, I think, and I think we can answer, I mean, we've been going out and wanting to have some conversation and have had some conversations with some of the public utilities to say, okay, what do we, you guys need um, to keep your power affordable? But there's been some opposition there. And then there's Congressman Doc Hastings. Um, who is fourth district, he has the Tri-Cities area, and he just loves to grandstand on this issue. And he's head of the Natural Resources, or no, they took the Natural out, the Resources Committee in Congress. And, uh, and so he's been some trouble too. Um, but in Oregon, like the state of Oregon has been really um, strong on this issue. Governor Kitzhaber, John Kitzhaber, is a, you know, he fishes, he loves salmon, he's been a strong supporter. So we, we just need to try to keep these conversations going. But I would say that's the, the Bonneville Power Administration and the ship. Um, OK, so the, the topic of this series is wilderness on the edge. My hope is that students look at wilderness through these different lenses, not just the capital building wilderness, but all of these areas that are either metaphorically or physically on the edge of wilderness giving your work that is largely focused on areas outside of wilderness, how does your organization view it? it? View the wilderness itself. Is it a potential 
potential habitat? Is it a, a storage area of, of habitat where salmon could potentially go if they can actually get there? Is it not really that important compared to all the areas throughout the system leading up to that? I'm just kind of curious. What, if you could sum up your value of what it is based on the work that you do? What is it? Well, I think from, from the perspective of our coalition and looking at salmon, it's, it's absolutely critical um, for the survival of these species. And I think what it represents to us actually is opportunity. The wilderness represents opportunity because we have lost so much salmon habitat in all these other river systems from development, from logging, from you know, channelization, all these um, <coughs> factors uh, beyond just dams that it's a costly and a lot of work to restore and it's worthwhile to do but you know I mean a you know a small river tributary I mean I do I do work on the Spokane a volunteer and it's we're you know hoping one day maybe they'll be able to get back up there um, but for the red band trout and it's a lot of money and it's a lot of work to restore those rivers here we have, and so you, know, you look at the upper Columbia Basin of what we've lost there and what it would try to, to take to bring salmon back to the Spokane. But you look over here in Idaho where you don't have to go in and do all, I mean, there's certainly places we need to do and can do restoration, but that's not the limiting factor. We have all this incredible habitat. It is the breadbasket of the entire basin. It is the ark. I mean, they, you know, David James Duncan calls it the ark. Um, where um, we have all these, this primary great spawning habitat and the salmon that's, that, you know, go there, can't make it down. You know, it used to take them two weeks to go from the Idaho wilderness to the ocean by just riding the snow melt, tail first. And now they hit these reservoirs and it can take them a month or more um, to get down there, hitting this hot water, dealing with the predators in the reservoir, dealing with the high temperatures, so you lose like 80% sometimes of some of the stocks and then them having to come back up that system. Um, but, but at the same time, right, the opportunities, like instead of restoring thousands of miles of habitat, we just need to take four obstructions out. And what the science shows us, what the scientists have looked at, is that if we took out those four dams, no, we're not going to have Lewis and Clark levels of salmon coming back, but we could get back to 1960s levels which, you know, provides that ecological component that those systems need. I mean, it'd be great to have millions coming back, but just being realistic. And we'd also have some to fish for, and we'd have fish for, to meet the treaty. So I think it's, it's opportunity for us. And just this beautiful connection, right, between the ocean and that wilderness that's pretty special here. <coughs> So earlier you talked about the cotton dam, and one of the pivotal points in that project was the FERC relicensing date, and that was sort of the turning point for that whole initiative. So in terms of these four dams, are, are there any relicensing pro processes on the horizon, or what's that like? Um, there's not, unfortunately. That's one of the, the challenges. Well, there's challenges and opportunities there, is that because they're federal dams, they don't come under the federal the Regulation Commission, FERC. Um, they, uh, so there's not that 50-year lease um, kind of deal. And so that makes it a little harder from the standpoint of not having that, that decision point where they have to come to the table and negotiate it. So where the decisions, decision points are right now has been in court where our coalition members, so the Commercial Fishing Association, sport, in Northwest Sport Fishing Industry Association, the conservation groups, have been involved in that litigation <coughs> along with the Nez Perce tribe and state of Oregon are all pushing for a legal plan um, in the court. And, um, and that's been a struggle. So that keeps kind of getting pushed out. And frankly, the Obama, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, the Obama administration has been as bad as the Bush administration when it comes to um, putting a legal plan together. What they put forward is absolutely laughable from you know, arguing that they shouldn't have to deal with the mortality that the dams cause because, you know, most of the dams, the four lower snake dams went in after the, e, you know, before the ESA came on, so they shouldn't have to deal with that mortality. I mean, that's the kind of 
argument that they were making in their plan. Um, that, so there is that court decision point. We're trying to force a political point of getting people together. And then there's some interesting things out there, I think, um, one of which is this whole sediment problem happening in Lewiston. Um, the Corps of Engineers has just released an environmental impact statement talking about how they're going to deal with the sediment that's causing the problem. It's 3 million cubic yards of sediment coming in yearly and dumping. So you can't just dredge it. It's, it's more than you can dredge. Then there's a the question of what you do with it once you take it out of the river. One of their ideas is they're going to create salmon habitat <laughs> or down the river by creating shallow areas, which of course will heat up again. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that they're throwing out there. And uh, they're trying to avoid the conversation about the levees and raising the levees. Um, so four years ago, they were supposed to start the study, and they came out talking about levees. Mayor of Lewiston said, over my dead body. And then they dialed back and went in underground for three years and now come out with this environmental impact statement that talks all about dredging and trying to manage sediment. And, and then you have to go into the appendices to find where they haven't taken you know, levee raising off the table. It's just buried into deep into the 1,000-page document where people won't see it. And so we're pushing that. Both, you know, there'll probably be a lawsuit over um, their dredging plan, and we're also pushing it locally with people to say, what do you guys want long-term here? Do you want, you want a 12-foot levy? Is, is that what you guys want, or is this time to look at other options? Yeah, uh, even if you guys remove these four dams on the lower Snake River, wouldn't the other four dams on the Columbia River prevent the Salmon River, or Salmon migration of the that's a good question. Yeah, why do, we fo like, why do we focus on the Lower Snake and aren't the Columbia dams um, equally a problem? And they are in a lot of ways. I mean, there's a lot of mortality at the four dams on the Lower Columbia as well, Bonneville, Dalles, John Day, McNary. Um, but there's two really big differences. One is that um, you don't have the same temperature problems down there because the Columbia, you are starting to see temperature problems, but because the Columbia is so much colder than the snake, <coughs> it, the, there's not um, the temperature problems behind the reservoirs. And the lower snake, it's a desert river. And now that's impounded, I mean, there's days where it gets up to 80 degrees and there's these huge fish kills. Um, so it's really lethal corridor. And in climate change scenario, it's only going to get worse. The other big argument is economic. I mean, the four dams on the lower Columbia actually provide real value. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, not that I wouldn't love to see the Dalles, um, you know, the Dalles Falls again, but it's a whole other economic argument. I mean, it's, it is serious flood control for Portland. It's barge transportation that is much more used than the lower Snake Corridor. Um, significant energy production and significant irrigation off John Day. You, know, you look at the Lower Snake, no flood control, not very much power produced, and a fraction of what is being shipped on the Lower Columbia when it comes to barge. So that's why the Lower Snake are sort of on the list. There was someone back there. Yeah. <laughs> take not based on any science or any sort of expertise on it because I don't work on grizzlies but um, but I will say there was a excellent um, series written in the spokesman review about 10 years ago that looked where it was a two-part series um, looking at that connection between grizzlies and salmon and what what used to be in Idaho and, uh, and, you know, the last grizzly, I think the last grizzly shot in Idaho was in, up in Clearwater country, um, right before Dwarshack went in. 
And, and so, and there's one of the arguments made that the reason that the grizzlies were holding on there was, well, it's like really rugged country, but there's also was this plentiful food source, right? And if you have bears having a plentiful food source like that, maybe, you know, they're not, they're staying away from humans more, I don't know. But I think there is a, I think that's a really interesting question to answer looking at grizzly bear interjection, which I know nothing, you know, I don't work on, I don't know much about, but you know, what are the ramifications or what are the issues to think about when you're having grizzlies coming back into country where their primary food source, right, is no longer there or is there in low numbers? And does that need to be factored in? You know, it's an, another, if you are trying to introduce grizzlies to a new area that used to have salmon, <laughs> you know, is, is, is it make it even more important to have the salmon? But there's some people that say that that's what really wiped out the grizzlies in Idaho and some of that country was when Dorshak went in and we lost the salmon. Yes, sir. Have there been published studies that estimate the value of the river fish lowering versus the value of the river dam? Excellent question. Yeah, there has there have been some really great economic studies done on that. Um, we've been arguing for more and more systematic, um, but. Uh, I mean, one of the independent economic studies that came out a few years ago estimated that a restored fishery in Idaho alone would be half a, like basically half a billion dollars to the state, the Idaho economy. That was separate from like a couple hundred million dollars that would um, be generated on tribal lands. And that's just looking at Idaho. That wasn't looking at Northeast Oregon, Southeast Washington, or the Lower Columbia. And one of the reasons there's such good economic studies of Idaho is that they, they kept the best records of catches and what people used to catch on the rivers um, now I'm going back, you know, into the 30s and 40s. And there's a whole great study on that. I'm happy to send to anybody here who's interested that looks at that. Um, when they did the analysis, so in two, 1999, the Corps did do a big EIS where they looked at and analyzed dam removal as one of their options. And they did a bunch of economic analysis then. And uh, <clears throat> the original, I know one of the economist people involved in the study, and when they did the original study looking at the recreation benefits on the Lower Snake, they came up with a billion dollars of what would be worth there with new recreation, above and beyond what the reservoir is providing right now. The Corps went ballistic and told them to go back and alter their numbers and they brought it down to 400 million. So even the core not wanting to show an economic benefit, their own study showed 400 million a year. And when you looked at Lewiston in terms of jobs, it was a 2,000 <coughs> job increase. That was the core. It might be off like 100 jobs or something, but it was around, I think, 2,000 jobs that they said would be created in Lewiston from a free flowing river. Um, you look down on the lower river, you know, in one good year, just in a few weeks, it was 15 million, just a buoy 10, just down on the lower Columbia. And, um, and, you know, and they did some good studies too in 2000 where we had a nice bump up of runs. And you look at some of those river towns like Riggins, Idaho, um, the salmon and steelhead fishery that year was 20% of that town's economy for the whole year. And they made that in six weeks. So you look at if you had restored fisheries the benefits that you would see to towns like Riggins and Chalice and some of these other towns that have been hit hard in the last 20 years by the decline in mining and timber and these other natural resource industries. Like what a great industry that would be. And you know, you look at that study, that economic study I mentioned first, and a lot of the dollars are staying in those local towns. And uh, so it'd be and that's worth, you know, a million dollars to Chalice is a lot of money, right, you know, for the year. So um, the economic benefits are pretty tremendous. Um, and I'll also say, too, that, you know, the economic effects are felt clear up in Alaska. I mean, Alaska Trollers Association is one of our member groups because they're fishing, they're healthy, their own managed runs up there, but our fish come up and mix with them once they catch so many endangered Snake River fish, they have to shut their fishery down. So, and you find that happen on the Oregon coast too. It's not like the commercial fishermen are fishing for, trying to fish for Snake River wild, you know, <laughs> salmon. But once they catch so many, many, 
then they have to shut the fishery down. And so uh, there's huge economic impacts in those towns. There was somebody, oh. In my first question, you mentioned the nurse, Nez Pierce tribe. I wondered if you could talk about their role in your coalition and their willingness to um, use their treaty rights in these negotiation process. Um, that's a great question. We, uh, um, and it's best, you know, I, I never speak for the tribes, um, but uh, we worked really closely with the lower Columbia River Treaty tribes um, uh, for well over a decade, and not just Nez Perce, but the Umatilla, Warm Springs, um, I'm forgetting somebody, Big Yakima, uh, and we were in court with them for 10 years, and it's their fisheries biologists and their science that did a lot of the science looking at what, why these dams needed to, to come out. And um, I don't want to go too much into it, but you know they were under tremendous pressure from Bonneville Power Administration to back off on the litigation, and eventually decided to do that in exchange for one billion dollars to help fund their fishery management and so you know their programs now. They were under a lot, I mean, they were also <laughs> losing. I mean, basically, I think Bonneville Power was starting to take those programs away. They were in a tough spot. Um, but, uh, but it was pretty hard um, to see that happen. Uh, the Nez Perce, however, um, did not sign the accords, as they're called, and they stayed in the litigation. And really, I mean, it's because the Nez Perce stand to lose the most. They're the Idaho tribe farthest up. And a lot of this money that BPA was offering was just going down to lower river stuff. <laughs> it wasn't going to help. You know, it wasn't, it, you know, a lot of that money's not going to programs that are helping those wild stocks. I mean, some of it's going to support a recreational trout fishery on Lake Roosevelt. You know, I mean, that's where some of the money's going. And so we work really closely with the tribes. And, um, and you know, it's, I think it's tough for them they're very careful in how they use their treaty rights and how they, um, uh, how they approach that. And they have definitely, you know, speak and defend them and talk about them and, and uh, I don't know ultimately what they will choose to do. The other species that's interested that the Nez Perce is working on too, it's another reason to deal with these dams, it's a, very important to them are the Pacific lamprey. And that could be a whole other conversation. But I think only like 12 made it back two years ago, maybe 100 coming back. And you know, they're these ugly little critters, but they were a really important food source for the tribes. And that has not been addressed at all. And the dams, you know, they migrate also. They're anadromous. And you know, the fish ladders don't work for the lamprey. And so that's kind of one, I think, species management issue that may be on the horizon of looking at, you know, how that plays in. Thanks. One more, or are we done? Oh. Um, who supports your coalition financially? And do you guys get federal money? We do not get federal money. No, uh, we get foundation money. We get, um, and private donor money. Um, private citizens in Idaho and some folks like people in uh, <coughs> Spokane. There's private donors, but then it's been foundation money. And uh, and currently we're a staff of three people right now, um, so we're kind of lean and mean. And then we're you know we have all our coalition members, of course, that get their money either from their membership or. Um, foundations, in some case, private donors, and they all chip in, of course, to the effort as well. Thank you, Sam. Thanks a lot. Yeah.